<clears throat> what, is it, what does it mean to follow? Simple English word we use all the time. I, I'm wondering today, in today's world, if follow doesn't mean five or six different things. If, if I'm in the hospital and the nurse says, follow me, as she leads me into an examination room or another room, um, or, or if I'm driving and I don't know where I'm going and, and somebody says, well, follow me. We, we understand that. I, I really don't know where I'm going, and so I ask someone or I need someone to help me get there. I mean, that's, that's following, right? Uh, I follow the Toronto Maple Leafs. And Montreal fans, I'm not just mentioning, mentioning this today because of what happened last night. But I, I watch... The, the, the Leafs whenever I can. I love it when they're doing great. Actually, I probably lose interest when they're not. At times in my life, I'd followed them intensely. And at times, I have no idea what's going on, and it's distant. We see some people in a situation like that where they're absolutely obsessed and it affects every aspect of their life. Uh, Saskatchewan Rough Rider fans are like that. More than anybody else, if you've ever lived there, it's insane. The entire province, uh, the loyalty and the feistiness. But is that what it means to really follow? Facebook or Twitter uses the word follow. Follow. What is that? That's differently. That, that simply means I'm going to connect with you in a way that keeps me in the loop. I get updates. But it's distant. I can, if I want, I can stay at arm's length relationally. Uh, and, and, and I just follow them so that I can find out what they post. Is this what it means to follow? I know that... Uh, you know, a few years ago, there was a picture that floated around the internet of Jesus sitting on a park bench with somebody and basically saying, no, 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 I, I actually want you to follow me, right? There's a difference in, in this understanding and in the, in, the, in the definition of this world, uh, of this word. In, when we were a kid, we played games like follow the leader. We know how that works, Right? One person's in front, and as they do things, that the people behind them follow and do exactly the same thing, mimicking, mimicking them. Or, or Simon Says, where you actually have to listen and mimic exactly without making mistakes. It's more of a pay attention kind of game, right? All of these give us different pictures of the word follow. I want to look today at our core value number four, which is following Jesus. We value wholehearted obedience to, G to Christ Jesus through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The series so far, this is week four, we've looked, at, <clears throat> we've looked at experiencing God's love and grace. We've looked at believing the Bible. We've looked at worshiping God. And, and all of those uh, all of those topics, they're all online. You can get them through our website if you, ca if you want, need to catch up, if you've missed some. So today is the fourth one, and it's simply following Jesus. I want to start right in that passage that Ken read to us just a couple of minutes ago, if you're still there in your Bibles. <coughs> in Matthew chapter 9. I want to start right there. This is um, Jesus coming up to Matthew, and Jesus as he's walking by, he saw Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Follow me, he says. What exactly does that mean? It's interesting that the first words Jesus says to his disciples is, follow me. And the last thing Jesus says to his disciples is, go and make disciples. Teach others to follow me. The first thing he says, the last thing he says, in between those two things are three years of showing them, walking with them, being an example and teaching them of exactly what that meant and how that works. In that process, in there, I see 
in there I see three things that I think are critical if we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to look at these a little in a few minutes, but in following Jesus, there needs to be the time and energy put into the learning. Because we need to learn new foundational principles for life. They're different than our world's foundational principles. This is a whole new set of life values that we've got to learn. But we also need to grow because we need to develop, we need to mature in those new patterns for living. They need to start coming to life and and living according to those new values and new principles. But the third thing is wholehearted obedience, which is more than just saying, I understand, or I get it, or I know it. This is actually making Jesus our master and our Lord. It's actually doing it. So in Matthew chapter 9 here, we see Matthew is sitting at his desk at work. And Jesus comes along and says, follow me. He's asking him to walk away from his career, to step away from his occupation. Uh, Everything that Matthew had built in his life, everything that he established, Jesus is saying, I have something better. Leave it and come and follow. That's a different definition of follow than clicking follow on Facebook or Twitter or help me not get lost or we want to head the same direction, or, or, or I'm a big fan. In Matthew not chapter 19, Jesus is talking with a rich young man who wants to go to heaven. He wants to have his eternal destiny secured and comes to Jesus to ask, and Jesus says, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. That's a big ask. Here is a rich young man. Sell everything you've got. Come and follow me. It's the same level of ask as Matthew. Walk away from the world you've built for yourself and follow me. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 26, let me read that quickly. You can keep your finger in Matthew if you want. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, And follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This is is hardcore. This is serious business. Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. Take up your cross and follow. What exactly does Jesus expect? Not everybody that followed Jesus followed Jesus in the way that he asked. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus heals a leper, a man with leprosy, and a great crowd gathers, and it says the great crowds followed him. There's lots of references to the crowds that followed Jesus. And, And these people wanted to hear, or they were curious, but they were walking around and actually following Jesus. In John chapter 6, Jesus teaches some really tough stuff. And this whole crowd that's following him gets up and leave, except for the 12. Can you imagine saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus? And then he says something, you're going, ooh, I don't like that part. What does that do? How does that change your attitude? Stark contrast to the disciples who left everything behind and followed So around Jesus, we see some of these same kind of varying attitudes towards following. We see the, you know, the the people that know where they want to go and they'll just say, well, I'll follow you, get me there. We see people who are a fan and I'll cheer you on, I love what you're doing. We see people who, who kind of like follow the leader, mindless copying 
And we see those who drop everything, jobs, family, dreams, and made him the master of their lives. Complete and total shift in life and life direction. This is clearly the expectation of Jesus when he invites you to follow him. A number of times, maybe, maybe three times in the last couple of years, I've talked about what it means to be a disciple. And when the rabbi comes up to a young man and says, follow me, what that means. And I won't go into a ton of that detail today. If you want to find it, if you look on our website under April 12th of this year, I spent about 15 minutes explaining this. And go back and look at that if you weren't here. But really quickly... <clears throat> The, the education system started when you were four or five years old and you would sit as a child with a group under a rabbi and he would teach you. And it would not just be the, the Bible, the Old Testament, the religious stuff. You would learn your math and your ge geography and all those kind of things as you lived life and walked around with the rabbi. But by the time you were 10 years old, you had uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy memorized by word for word. At that point, there was a cut at 10 years old. The best students continued on. The other students disappeared. Went back home to start learning the trade of their father. 10 to 12, it would be more intense and, and more, uh, more memorization. At 12 years old, there'd be another cut. Or, or 13 to 14 years, again, there would be another cut. At 16 years old, the school system finished. And the rabbi, who started with this big group of children, may only have a few left, but he would pick one, maybe two out of that whole group, the best out of the best, and he would say, come, follow me. Take my yoke upon you, is the words he would use. That's the words every Jewish boy growing up wanted to hear because it meant you're the best of the best. You qualify. The whole point of this whole process was the rabbi, his yoke. What that meant was the way he lived, the way he understood the Bible, the way he taught, the way he interacted with people. All the ways he does this is his yoke. And he would say to the best student, follow me, take my yoke, which basically says from now till you're 30, we're going into a different level of leading and learning. By the time you're 30, you will be exactly like me. And then you will be a rabbi in my line and continue my way into the future and grab other kids and teach them and perpetuate this. Okay, now when you think about that, think about what Jesus is doing. Jesus comes up to to people in their 16, 17, 18 years old who are doing the family trade, or Matthew who is a tax collector, and he's coming up to these people saying, follow me. These are the people that got rejected from the system. And Jesus comes up and says, follow me, take my yoke. They drop everything and they go. And the next years of training was to become exactly like him in his ways so that you could then get disciples and teach exactly the same thing. This is the whole idea. That's what it means. That's what it is. His expectation was that his followers were authentic and real. And that they were going to go and make more authentic and real disciples. That is what it means to follow Jesus. I'll say it a couple of times this morning. Jesus began his work of restoring the world to God while he was on earth. He gave his followers the job of continuing that. Following Jesus, we value the wholehearted obedience to Christ Jesus through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That phrase in the middle of this core value, Wholehearted obedience. Wholehearted obedience. I mentioned earlier I see three things involved here. I want to talk about those for just a second. Because I think these are three clear expectations for, from Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. For those who would follow him. Following Jesus involves learning. 
time and energy and focus to learn a whole new set of foundational principles for life. These are very different principles of life than the world teaches us. We're learning an entirely new set of values, values that will transform our homes and our families and our towns. Because this is drastically different. And if we hold to these values, I will be drastically different. If I got up today and packed up my family and we moved to Zimbabwe, we would have to learn a whole different way of living. To follow Jesus is a whole different way of living. And we have to learn those principles. But though, can't stop there because following Jesus then involves growing and maturing and putting those principles into practice. It implies change. There's no such thing as stagnation because we're developing new patterns for living. We take those new set of principles that we're learning and we reshape our lives accordingly. But it doesn't just stop there because following Jesus involves obeying to do the will of God, not whatever we want. That's hard. That's hard to get our heads wrapped around. He calls the shots. He's on the throne. He leads. I follow. Let me explain it this way. I don't know many of you follow Francis Chan on the internet. And I listen to Francis Chan quite a bit. And there is a 15-minute video on YouTube that he does that's simply called Basics Following Jesus. And it's about 15 minutes long. It's worth listening to if you can find it. Here's some of the things he says in there. He says, this world is full of people who call themselves followers of Jesus, but their life is nothing like his. They're not obeying what he asked them to do. They're not living as he asked them to live. They're not following the way he showed them, but they're convinced that they're following Jesus. Imagine playing Simon Says or follow the leader. We've got a room full of kids and a long line of kids and we're playing and one kid decides, I'm going to change the rules. I'm not actually going to do what he says. I'm just going to do it in my mind. Picture that, right? We're playing Simon Says. One kid sits on the couch. I'm just going to do it in my mind. Are they actually playing? They're not, Right? doesn't matter how authentic he is, he's not following the leader. So, almost all of us have heard this phrase that parents say to their kids, go clean up your room, right? What if you said to your kid, go clean up your room, they disappear for an hour, they come back after an hour and they said, dad, I've listened to what you said. I memorized what you said. Go clean your room. I could even say it in Greek. At supper time, the discussion comes back around that, and the kid says, Dad, I've been thinking about this all day. I can't get it out of my mind. Actually, I've called my friends. We're going to start meeting once a week together to get together and unpack this and talk about what it would look like if we actually cleaned our rooms. Okay, we laugh, right? How silly is that? Why do you think that's going to fly? Just go do it. Why do you think this is going to fly with Jesus? Jesus was about as black and white as you get. Jesus would look at people and say right in their face, Why do you call me Lord? And you don't do what I say. Do you know what Lord actually means? Luke 6 and Matthew 7 why do you call someone Lord or Master and then not listen to them? Jesus never accepted words without action behind it. We know that. Well, back to Matthew chapter 9. Because this, this little passage here, he calls Matthew, follow me. And then he goes to Matthew's house and this whole discussion happens with the Pharisees who are criticizing him for spending time with people like Matthew. And Jesus says, verse 12, Those who are well 
have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He's not here to call the righteous people. Why? Because the righteous people have it covered. I got this. I can do this. I'm doing all the right things. I'm living the right way. They have no need for Jesus. As we've seen, that's not following. It may be heading the same direction, but they're saying, thank you, but I'll just take my own path. And I know lots of people that are like that. They believe, and they're confident, and they're good people, and they're filling churches and even spending time reading our Bibles, but they're not following Jesus. I think Jesus draws a big, fat line in the sand on this. I'm not sharing anything that's not true from Scripture. And if I am, let me know. This is the way of Jesus. Jesus' first words were, follow me. His last words, go and make followers. Here it is, really oversimplified. Jesus began his work on earth of making disciples. And he makes them to become a follower of Jesus. And that meant they were going to pick it up and carry that forward. So maybe there are three kinds of followers or three different understandings of the word follower for in our world. But only one of them applies to this. There are distant followers, like, like following the church on Facebook. You stay up to date, you have the info, you got the likes and the links, and I can maintain arm's distance when I want or I can draw close when I want. People follow Jesus that way. There are those who are just shallow followers. It's like, I'm going to that house too. I don't know how to get there. I'll follow you. So we're heading the same way. The word follow in the Greek in the New Testament is actually the combination of two words. It's the word road and the, road and the word union. It's our roads are together, which means not just are we walking the same way, but it's the same road, the same direction, the same path, the same way of getting there. That's this, that's this word. But it, the shallow follower just says, I need help getting to where I want to get. Maybe that's heaven. Maybe that's a better life. Maybe that's hope or joy or peace. And they'll just follow to say, help me get there. I want to go to heaven, so I'll follow you there. That's not following. The authentic follower picks up his yoke and goes. And it transforms every aspect of life. It's active. It's now, and it's always, and it's forever. It's a complete and total shift in life and direction. It makes Jesus our master, and our Lord, and our God. This kind of following is impossible. Unless the last phrase of our core value is there without the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit makes it possible to actually learn the new principles for life and the new values. The Holy Spirit makes it possible to grow and mature and to begin to live by those principles. The Holy Spirit makes it possible to listen to God and do what He says in obedience. John 16 says that the Holy Spirit will come and guide you in truth. In John 14, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and remind you of the things you've learned. In John 15, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and teach you the truth about Jesus. In John 16, the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world of sin and show you how to live right in God's way. We desperately need the Holy Spirit in this. Life will look different because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus. We're diligent and we're faithful, but we're not doing this on our own power. Because there's some kinds of follow that I can do. I got this. I can handle this. I can manage this. Following Jesus the way Jesus asks, we cannot do without his presence. Peter one of Jesus' disciples, Jesus came to him in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. 
Jesus says to Peter, follow me. And Peter left everything and, with his brother, and they followed him. But if we track along with Peter's life, we see Peter was the bold and brash and aggressive one. Peter was a, I got this kind of guy. He was always the first one to jump, the first one to respond, to get going. Um, but we see at the end of Jesus' life, in John chapter 21, Jesus says to Peter again, follow me. This is after Peter had denied Jesus. And interestingly, the phrase the Bible uses there is, Peter followed Jesus from afar after Jesus had been arrested. What was the first thing that, that when, when the, the, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, how did Peter respond right then? He pulls out his, his dagger and starts swinging. And then they take Jesus away and he, 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 he follows from a distance and then even begins to argue with people that he doesn't even know him, he's never met this guy. Jesus comes back after his crucifixion and sits down with him. John chapter 21 says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And in John chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus says to Peter again, follow me. Peter, trying to follow Jesus on his own power, screwed up and screwed up and dropped the ball and failed and kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And Jesus says at the beginning of this relationship, towards the end of the relationship, he says it twice, follow me. And then, in, later in that same chapter, Jesus is talking about John and Peter interrupts and says, well, what about this? What about this? You know what Jesus says? Don't worry about him. You follow me. Why, you ever wonder why Jesus said to Peter, follow me so many times? I think that's good news for somebody like me. Peter was a my way. I'll never. I'll always. You can count on me. He spent three years learning. He keeps dropping the ball. But have a look at Peter after Jesus rose and ascended and sent the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit filled Peter on the day of Pentecost, he was the first one, again, the first one, out there preaching. We see through the book of Acts a huge difference in him. Same personality, same aggressive, same out there, same all, always but now full of the Holy Spirit, he can no longer just fulfill his own goals or his selfish whims. He had a desire and a strength to live Jesus' way. And over and over and over, Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to follow well. I love the fact that he invited Peter to follow him so many times. The promise of Jesus to his authentic followers is that every step will be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. And he will give us what we need to face the circumstances of life. Following Jesus. We value wholehearted obedience to Christ Jesus through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. As followers, we are called to learn, to develop new ways of living, to obey his will in everything. He is the master. He is the Lord. We are the followers. If, if we were in India, it would be common to see the, a guru or a holy man walking around with a group of his followers, his disciples. We still see that in days, in, in, even in today's day. And this group will follow literally everywhere he goes. And everything he does, no matter how severe or how mundane, they will obey every word, even trying to anticipate his next word so they can get there ahead of him or do it without him having to ask. 
There's a willingness to learn and have their own thinking completely remodeled. And there's a constantly practicing new patterns of living. No arguing, no challenging, just simply obey. Following Jesus ought to be like that. To do this, we have to be alert and sensitive and obedient to His Spirit. So, as if we were playing follow the leader or Simon says, we need to be mimicking and learning and adjusting our lives to match His character, to to match His priorities, His ways, His direction, to accomplish His mission, His pursuits, His cause. He gives us his reason, his purpose. We think like he thinks. We see through his eyes. This is this core value. It's becoming like Jesus. That's what a follower and a disciple and a master is. To become exactly like my master. To learn new foundational principles and values for life. To develop new patterns for living. Growing in those day after day. And wholehearted obedience which is more than just understanding that he's master and Lord, but actually doing what he said. Follow me, Jesus said. Are you hearing the call today to follow Jesus? Whether you're hearing this for the first time or you've heard it a million times, Jesus says, follow me. I want to call you today to authentically follow Jesus. It means everything. It costs everything. It affects everything. It changes everything. But actually, it's why you're on the earth. In a couple of minutes, Ken will give you an opportunity to respond to that this morning after we sing this song. But today is the day to follow. Whether it's our first time or whether it's like Peter, follow me, yes. Follow me, yes. Follow me, yes. Today is the day. Let's follow well. Are you with me? It's central to everything we believe. Following Jesus, we value the wholehearted obedience to Christ Jesus through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. (coughs) Our Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for being in this so black and white. Thank you for painting a picture of what this looks like through your life, through your words. Thank you for giving us truth about God and how to know God. Thank you that you say your yoke is easy. But God, we know that this is a narrow road. That few find it. God, today, would you stir in our hearts. Give us more than just an understanding of what it really means to follow Jesus. But God, give us the presence of your Holy Spirit in us to drive us forward to live as a follower of Jesus. To finish the work that you've started, that you set out to do. God, we sing that old chorus, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. We've sang that so many times. God, would you stir in our hearts that we would actually follow, not just study it and memorize it and think about it and ponder it. God, make us authentic followers of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.